what really is conversion therapy and then kind of therapy that you do, which is reintegrative therapy? I would dare people to consider conversion therapy is sort of a false flag. It's a bit of a red herring. How do you look at the origin of same-sex attraction? Kind of elephant in the room, how much of this is nature? We know it's a significantly smaller than majority percentage. What are those environmental factors? I'm gonna explain some that both relate to my own story, but also to the stories of hundreds of other men and people I know and clients I've worked with. And I'm gonna share with you that the church has not been silent on this either. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today, we're going to be sitting down with Michael Gasparro, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist. He has an incredible personal story and he does some really incredible work in Los Angeles. Quick content warning here. We're going to be talking about some issues that might not be appropriate for younger audiences. So if you're a mom or dad, or you're in a car with young ones, there's that content warning for you. This might be something to listen to when kids are not in the car. It's not going to get graphic, but these are serious themes having to do with same-sex attraction and other sexuality issues. Michael Gasparro, welcome to the podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I'm really glad you're here. There's a lot to talk about with you. And let's start with your background. You've got a clinical background. You've got a musical background. But tell us a little, little bit about that. Yeah. So I grew up singing. I love music. Um, and I grew up singing, playing piano, and sharing this music with the world until then in my late 20s, I was like, you know what? There's more going on here that I want to look at within myself mm. and how I can share my gifts with others. So I went back to school and I became a therapist. So now I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in California and a licensed professional clinical counselor. And I have my own therapy practice where I uh, do professional counseling. Awesome. And one of the things that you focus on in your practice, which is sadly controversial, especially <laughs> in a state like California, is helping and assisting those who are experiencing same-sex attraction. Tell me more about that. Yeah, I work with a lot of men in particular, so I can work with men, women, and other adults on this topic, but I mostly focus on work with men, and a lot of men from even a diverse religious background, actually, so I work with Muslim men, Christian men, and a lot of Catholic men, but people often for this particular issue with unwanted same-sex attractions, they don't identify as gay, but they have some kind of sexual confusion or a sense of that their sexual feelings don't match up with their highest goals for their life or their integrated sense of self or religious identity. So they seek professional counseling to try to understand a little bit better what might be contributing to the emergence of those feelings and behaviors and how to better respond to them and potentially explore healing underlying factors which may be contributing to them so they may be more free for morality free for mm. the good in their life so already that term you used unwanted sexual same-sex attraction because i think a lot of people might hear same-sex attraction in the culture and think well that's the way you're born you're mm. wired that way and if you don't act out on your attractions and pursue whatever that lifestyle may be or that identity is, then you're sort of squashing yourself or hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. What would you say to that and help me understand more of this idea or help you know share with the audience more of this idea of unwanted same-sex attraction? So two parts there. The first part is even mainstream science is clear on this. Sexual attraction is fluid and it is not something you're born with. Mm -hmm. And the American Psychological Association, which is the largest body of psychologists in the world, on their frequently asked questions section of LGBTQ issues, say in their own words, there is no scientific consensus on the origin or development of same-sex attraction. This is a liberal progressive organization. Then they go on to say most people believe some complex combination of nature and nurture contribute to the emergence of what they call LGBTQ orientations, which is a phrasing that I would even take issue with. But the complex combination of nature and nurture seems to fit very much in line with what the church has said over many decades on this topic. And further, the saddest part is they then go on to make a moral claim. The APA then goes on to say that it is normal and healthy. That's a philosophical claim. That's a moral claim. So we have the right as Catholics to make our own philosophical and moral claim, or Christians, or Muslims, by the way, or Jews, or every major world religion, which makes similar claims to ours, which is that our orientation is really male or female, and it is an identity we are bestowed by the God who loves us, bestowed with by the God who loves us, and that our responsibility and gift and opportunity is to receive that and to express it according to his designs for our body. Do you think that's a message, not just for people who believe in a God, but it can be a message for anyone? I know you mentioned these major world religions and, you know, Muslims see you and evangelical Christians, Catholic Christians, but 
what about someone who doesn't hold to any religion? How should they maybe view sexuality and same-sex attraction? I think people of goodwill mm -hmm. can be very open to the type of truths we're talking about here today. Because as I know, we're both Catholic, but at Good Friday service, for instance, we pray for people who are Catholic, people who are uh, Christians, people who are of other religions, people who believe in God and people of goodwill, you know, in those Good Friday um, intercessions. And being of goodwill, I think in my mind, means receptivity to truth. And the truth that we're talking about is built into the natural order of, of biological design and of human flourishing. So I think even if you're not religious, a lot of these things we're discussing can reveal truth about ourselves and about society that are very freeing and f help with human flourishing, I think. I think that's great. I, I think it's a great answer. There's a lot to get into here and we're going to go all into it. And it's, again, a, such an important topic because for so many reasons, this affects a lot of people, family, friends, loved mm -hmm. ones. And then it's obviously become a highly, hotly contested political, social, cultural issue, you mm. know, the whole gamut of sexuality issues. It's it's in the news, it's debated, it's discussed. But I want to start with your background more because you said you were really musical, you were into music, that was a passion of yours, and then you felt this calling to become a therapist. And mm -hmm. now you're this is part of your expertise is helping those with, with same-sex attraction. What inspired that? When I was growing up in around middle school is when I started noticing I had same-sex attraction mm -hmm. myself and uh, we're a similar age. And that was an era where different than today, I will say it was not something that was really celebrated. It was scary. It was confusing um, because it was still kind of considered taboo to discuss these things. Um, and shortly after some of those issues of mine began emerging in compulsive behaviors I was struggling with, I had very incredible encounters with Jesus, um, particularly in the Eucharist. So if your listeners are Catholic, it's funny because the experience I had in the Eucharist as a freshman in high school um, came at a time, sorry, it's just, it's a lot to process, but it came at a time when I was most resistant to even the idea of what Eucharistic adoration was or what our uniqueness as Catholics meant, because I was raised in the Bible Belt and there was a lot of influence from my friends and family that made me kind of minimize some of the Catholic uh, beliefs and understandings of the Eucharist and why we do adoration. And in adoration, Jesus revealed to me in the midst of my doubt and confusion that it was real. And it was at the lowest point of my life, a few months after that, that that revelation, it became so clear well, like, what a grace it was, because I think it gave me an anchor point to say, okay, well, if the church's teachings are true, and I have this inner conflict with these sexual feelings and confusion, I've got to find a way to approach this that integrates those two things. And I'm telling you, it's grace. Like, I'm not here as a poster boy. I'm here as a messy person with a, a complex background who God has touched my heart to want to share that there is a different way you can respond to these struggles and issues that you have. Um, but I am truly just grateful that I even had the chance to be shown that at a time where I needed it, because it gave me the encouragement to seek support, to talk to a priest about these issues, to talk to a counselor when I was a teenager about these struggles, and really get different eyes on the ball to help me see how I could address these in a way that was integrated with my faith, which was a sincere faith. Even though I was a young person, it was sincere. Did you feel that as a young person dealing with same-sex attraction and also having your own spiritual journey, did you have the support that you needed? I did in many ways. And I think that's one of the reasons I'm speaking out because you asked like, well, how did you become a therapist? But if you remember like 2015, let's rewind, you know, it seems like a, a lifetime ago, but that's when the entire country began to shift its perception of what marriage is, because I think it's Obergefell versus Hodges, you know, changes the definition of marriage. And all of a sudden at that age in my late twenties in 2015, I thought, okay, the culture is now swinging like a pendulum to the degree that we yet have yet to see come to fruition. Who are people listening to to talk about this? And I realize people are not as attentive to religious voices on this topic, but people are quoting, legislators are quoting therapy organizations, they're quoting medical associations. So that was part of the reason I became a therapist was I thought, well, I guess people like me and others, we need to like enter the arena of the language of the culture and begin to understand it from that perspective so we can witness to the culture using the language of the culture mm -hmm. response to. 
you've got a lot of uh, chips stacked against you because you're in California. So you're like, (laughs) well, it's tough. And you know this. I mean, California, first of all, is making legislation that would uh, it has a chilling effect, I think, on the work that you do to help uh, people who experience same sex attraction, where you could be accused of doing conversion therapy and hurting minors. And there, there's actually a loss of a license or other criminal penalties associated with that in California is my understanding nationally, the whole view of therapy, you know, leading someone out of same sex attraction is seen as conversion therapy is seen as bad. What's your take on all of that and the climate that you're operating in, in California, you're in Los Angeles, yes. which is the, the belly of the beast. Yes. Seven Weeks Coffee is America's pro-life coffee company on a mission to fund the pro-life movement one cup of delicious coffee at a time. Why are they called Seven Weeks Coffee? Because at seven weeks, the baby is the size of a coffee bean, and it's the same time that the heartbeat can be first clearly detected on ultrasound. That's why Seven Weeks Coffee donates 10% of every sale to support pregnancy resource centers across the country. Seven Weeks Coffee has raised over half of a million dollars, $500,000 for these centers, and has helped save 5,000 lives by providing free ultrasounds and other resources to moms in need. Now, let me tell you about the delicious coffee. Seven Weeks Coffee is harvested from the top 1% to 2% of beans in the world. Their beans are mold-free, pesticide-free, shade-grown, and low-acid, and they're organically farmed. Seven Weeks Coffee truly checks all the boxes. And just in time for the holiday season, Seven Weeks Coffee is having their biggest promotion yet. You can enjoy exclusive discounts, free gifts with every order, and new limited edition coffees. And exclusively for my listeners, you can go to sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code LILA for up to 25% off your order. That's sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code LILA for up to 25% off your first order. There is an organization, an international organization called the International Federation for Therapy and Counseling Choice. And I go to their conferences sometimes in Budapest and Poland and different countries. And there are lawyers and, and counselors and pastoral ministers from the United States and 28 to 38 countries, you know, and the significant numbers of countries around the world. So what we're talking about, yes, is it applies to California, but it's a global movement and a lot of the Western countries are taking the same plays plays out of the same playbook from one another. So what's kind of cool about that is we have this diverse international coalition of people that are trying to push back. What I would say is it's no coincidence that they use the word conversion to describe what they're talking about as therapy for unwanted same-sex attractions. Because what is the thing we usually associate the word conversion with? Religion. So they'll say it's not an anti-religious bill but they're weaponizing a religious term in the therapy realm to try to both, let's say, make minimize the legitimacy of a conversation with a professional about these issues, even though ironically, psychosexual development and the way it impacted human sexuality was like the origins of the Western psychological Mm -hmm. therapy model. But everything's on the table to discuss with your therapist, except this issue now. Is that so? What is the law, the, the state of the law in California? The state of the law is that for minors, and and there are no states in the United States right now, to my knowledge. So you can fact check me, mm-hmm. but um, there are no states in the United States, to my knowledge, right now, that have any kind of law on the books that would prevent talk therapy, which is what I do, standard evidence based talk therapy, for this issue: gender dysphoria, same sex sexual issues for adults. There are a lot of laws that attempt to restrict that for children, for anyone under 18, but they've often lumped together transgender issues and same-sex attraction under one umbrella term. And so that's why we call conversion therapy, that word is like a kitchen sink term. They just like throw anything into it they can in these bills that kind of just makes generally therapists afraid of doing anything other than what they're gonna call gender affirming care or gay affirming therapy. Um, that That's generally how it works. So it's not very specific. It, and it, the broadness of it, which is happening right now in California as well with marriage, with the definition of marriage through propositions being prom- promoted here now, one, by the way, being promoted by the same senator who try or the same congressman who tried to call conversion therapy fought fraudulent business practices. And they included churches in that. And that was in around 2018. Um, so there is a general push towards trying to criminalize or penalize any therapy that does not lock in lockstep go along with 
LGBT ideology and gender mm -hmm. affirming care. So if you're our, if you're a 14 or 15 year old, well, let's talk about yourself, your own okay. story, right? Yep. I mean, you shared that you experienced same sex attraction and you were wrestling with that and navigating that. And if you were seeking guidance about that yep. and you were in California, mm -hmm. would you have been able to go to a therapist like yourself? No. It's incredible. No, because I don't see anyone under 18 at this point in my therapy practice to protect myself from any kind of potential accusation that I'm doing something that would violate this law, which, by the way, it's interesting to note in the yeah. NIFLA case mm -hmm. at the Supreme Court level, in his ruling, Justice Clarence mm -hmm. Thomas references the the specific board versus brown or brown versus pickup the case that was trying to challenge the minors conversion therapy law in california he referenced in that case as an example of a case that was decided in an unconstitutional manner or limiting unconstitutional manner manner mm -hmm. excuse me limiting professional speech mm -hmm. And so we know that the Supreme Court is primed to potentially, we hope, strike down the unconstitutionality of these laws that are restricting rights, conscience rights, and religious freedom rights of minors. So the, obviously the opposition would say, well, conversion therapy of minors is so evil, and there are these you know, historical horror stories of young kids who s struggled with same-sex attraction and, you know, in some horror stories, they were forced to watch, you know, straight porn or they ended up committing suicide because they weren't accepted for, for the attractions that they had because their, you know, overbearing fundamentalist parents made them go to Christian therapists. Right? This is the narrative mm -hmm. about how horrible uh, conversion therapy is. What really is conversion therapy and the, what's the difference between conversion therapy and then the con kind of therapy that you do, which is reintegrative therapy? Reintegrative therapy is a trademarked brand of therapy founded by Dr. Mm -hmm. Joseph Nicolosi Jr. Mm -hmm. That is not the only method of therapy to utilize to address unwanted gender dysphoria or same-sex sexual feelings and sexualized attachments but it is one of many that are ethical, that are based in standard evidence-based talk therapy practices. And reintegrative therapy, since we mentioned that particular method, bases itself on the model that traumas, either things that should have happened but didn't, so developmental deficits, or bad things that happen that shouldn't have, need to be addressed because they may contribute to the emergence of gender dysphoria or same-sex sexual issues. And using standard trauma-based treatments like eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is called EMDR or mindful self-compassion, things like that to tr address these traumas, relationship deficits, et cetera, some people experience healing and shifts in their sexuality as a result. That is not even the goal of therapy. The goal of therapy is to address traumas and to uh, promote psychological well-being, to promote spiritual and psychological integration, and to promote self-control and freedom to respond to our passions in a way that's guided by right reason. Any th shift in feelings or behaviors is, a, is an effect of therapy. And what's really important to keep in mind is our opponents don't have precise definitions either. They just use terminology that is broad and ill-defined to try to create like scare tactics. So what I would dare people to consider is Conversion therapy is sort of a false flag. It's a bit of a red herring. We don't even need to play on their terms. We should promote that we want to talk about types of therapy, reintegrative therapy or other kinds of therapy that will help young people acknowledge difficulties or wounds that they have experienced in their families or through their peers or through issues in their life, and that they have the right to bring those to a therapist who can use normal therapeutic talk-based interventions to help them better understand themselves and see healing. And, and last thing I'll add to that is I'm Catholic. So I believe above all, we are corporal spiritual, corporal spiritual beings, body, soul, unity. We cannot so easily isolate, we cannot isolate psychological and spiritual issues. So for many people, myself included, there was a double wound in many of my things that I was struggling with, a spiritual wound that I needed healing and deliverance from, and psychological wounds and developments that needed milestones I needed to achieve and go through. And I'm still on my healing journey. So would you say that same-sex attraction always originates with some sort of trauma, whether it's a deficit trauma or a, a incidents that happened that were hurtful, or 
Is it nature to some degree? How do you look at the origin of same-sex attraction yeah. from a clinical perspective? So I want to help us look at this from an attachment lens. There is also a religious lens to look at it through. But first, let's talk about it through an attachment lens. Children need to know that they're loved unconditionally. Full stop, as they say. <laughs> um, that doesn't happen perfectly. It happened perfectly, I think, in one family, the Holy Family. <laughs> and in every other family, I would call it a spectrum of knowing how beloved you are because your family is meant to model God's unconditional love for us. <clears throat> so for those who that doesn't happen to a degree that causes attachment insecurity, meaning the caregivers I'm geared to being bonded with and to know that they can meet my needs, when they're not able to meet them, that can develop into what we call an insecure or anxious attachment style. So I would argue from an attachment lens perspective, children who have insecure attachments with their parents, with other conf confluent factors, are susceptible to certain psychological issues. One being same-sex feelings that can develop. At around age two or three, for instance, if a boy is insecurely attached to his primary attachment figure, his mom, but there's some insecurity in that attachment, at that age, he's meant to, according to a lot of developmental models, to shift his primary attachment to dad at the gender identity phase of development, which is around two to four years old is and what a lot of people And you're saying think. that's a healthy thing. That's a good thing, to right? To shift to dad at around two. For men. And I'm talking about men and same-sex mm -hmm. attraction from a, from a male developmental perspective. There's nuances and different angles to mm -hmm. consider with women. So at around age two to four years old is when we see men, boys, needing to shift from mom as primary attachment figure to dad. But when, due to a variety of issues that, that doesn't occur as completely as it should, men can have what I would call gender insecurity start to emerge and develop. That could be due to both psychological factors in the family, but also external factors like interference or interruption through abuse or peer issues or an older sibling causing problems or even genetic predisposition. And that's the kind of elephant in the room, how much of this is nature, right? We don't know how much we know it's a significantly smaller than majority percentage. Most studies estimate genetic predispositions at around 28%. And that's not even like a single gene characteristic. That's a combination of genetic predispositions that total 28% of genetic predisposition towards developing same-sex sexual feelings and behaviors in adulthood. But keep in mind, most psychological traits that we consider normal for treating and therapy have genetic predispositions on average around 45%. And it's around 30, 28 to 33% for same-sex attraction, according to the Ghana et al. study, which was the largest study ever done on the human genome. And that mirrors what we see over and over through twin studies. So let's say 32, 33% genetic predisposition. Guess what the likelihood of being religious is? Predisposition, 33%. But we don't say someone is born religious or not. By, wow. Yeah. So uh, that's so fascinating because the, the narrative today is you're born this way and you're a bigot if you don't acknowledge that or accept that. And there's no conversation, I think, happening nationally. You're not allowed to have the conversation about whether there were issues in your childhood there were deficits, I think you used the word, that led to same-sex attraction because same-sex attraction is supposed to be seen as, if not even a neutral, a good thing that an is a, a, an innate and affirmative thing, yep. um, a positive thing. So what would be some examples of, you mentioned the attachment to a male figure, a father, you know, between the ages of two and four would be important for boys as an example. What would be some examples of why same-sex attraction might develop because of that other 70% or so experiences that a, a kid might have. And as I answer Am this- Am I understanding the, 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 da the data correctly? So you're saying roughly 30% is, is due to genetic deep predisposition. So the 70 other percent of this happening- it has is, to be environmental factors. Is environmental factors. So yeah, I guess the question is then to be more clear here, what are those environmental factors? So I'm going to explain some that I think both relate to my own story, but also to the stories of hundreds of other men mm -hmm. and people I know and clients I've worked mm -hmm. with. And I'm going to share with you that the church has not been silent on this either. The Catholic Church has released document after document throughout the 20th century in the United States and internationally through the Congregation of Christian Education, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, identifying these same types of factors as potential causal factors for the emergence of homosexuality. For instance, 
they've said things like exposure to pornography through like they say license and shows and publications was the old timey phrase they use, but exposure to pornography, which we know happens at an extremely early age right now with children. That's a trauma. Okay. So especially if somebody's already mm -hmm. insecurely attached with their same sex father figure, and on top of that, as sensitive as a predisposition towards some of these things that make maybe more susceptible to developing these issues, combine that with negative peer experiences with their male same-sex peers, and then early exposure to pornography, well, unmet attachment needs can become sexualized because that energy, that longing, that desire for a father to give me attention, affection, and approval, that for either due to a lack of the attunement of the father or other factors contributing to a difficulty in integrating or internalizing that attachment, might make that child susceptible to developing a sexualized attachment if exposed early to pornography. Mm -hmm. And the church identified that in multiple documents as a potential causal factor. They also talked about abuse being a potential causal factor for the emergence of homosexuality. Sexual abuse sexual or any abuse. abuse. And, and other abuse, but especially mm -hmm. sexual abuse. They, the church mm -hmm. also identified, and these are church documents from Vatican congregations. So these are high level church teaching documents. So we don't have to have certainty, though, about what causes same-sex attraction to know that the church also says it's objectively, the inclination itself is objectively disordered. Mm. The acts are intrinsically disordered. The inclination itself is objectively disordered. So my question is, I'll, I'll share some more examples mm. as we talk, mm. but if something is objectively disordered, did it come from nothing? Is it objectively mm. disordered by default? I would say we should be more curious than that. Mm -hmm. And even if we don't know the exact answer for every person in every circumstance, at least give them the opportunity and the right to reflect on their own life and think what might have happened that contributed to why I have this objectively disordered inclination and how can I invite God's love mm -hmm. into that part of my heart or soul or body or mind? I think that's such a good point, Michael. And even if you're not a Catholic or Christian or practicing faith, the studies that have been done show that, you know, maybe 30% of this is from nature, you know, same-sex attraction and sexual identity, and then the rest is from environmental factors. Even separate from a religious context, shouldn't be people be curious? Yes. What were the environmental factors that led to my sexual interests and, and attractions? Yeah, and I would argue, too, irrespective of what caused them, mm -hmm. I have the right as an individual to respond to them according to my conscience. Um, so that means that whether or not I can determine what caused them and whether or not this person over here says that's not a that's not what happened to you or they have a different narrative to explain my story, I still get to choose my path. Mm -hmm. <laughs> me, the individual, not somebody else outside external to me. You are not my conscience outside mm -hmm. person. I've been given a conscience. And I think St. Henry Newman said um, the conscience is the aboriginal vicar of Christ mm -hmm. in the soul. And so we have the right to conscience, even if the studies show something different one day. What if they showed something different one day? Well, I wouldn't change my conscience and it wouldn't change my belief that Jesus has a better plan mm -hmm. for our sexual impulses. The catechism says either, basically they make it simple. They're like, either man governs his, pa governs his passions and becomes happy or becomes governed by his passions and becomes unhappy. So mm -hmm. the choice is not black and white totally because it's a, a journey to get there. You know, chastity is a journey, but we're all called to that journey. No one gets a pass, even if you don't struggle with same-sex attraction. You know, like we all have that exacting work to respond to grace mm -hmm. in our life, to try to integrate our conscience with our sexual feelings. Can you share more about your story? You said, you know, you're you're an example of this in the environmental factors leading mm -hmm. to um, same-sex attraction. And then you also shared you've talked to now hundreds of other people and, and know that their stories. What are some environment some more of those environmental factors? Covenant Eyes helps men and women achieve victory over porn addiction by blocking explicit websites and helping you connect with your accountability partner. This is such a beautiful approach to ensuring that people can have victory over porn addiction. Covenant Eyes has a special program called Arise, which is a 21-day video series specifically designed to help Christian women overcome sexual addiction. Arise helps you identify the wounds at the root of sexual addiction. This is a safe and confidential community for support. You can get 30 days of Covenant Eyes for free by going to the link in the description and using the code LILA at checkout. Okay, so for me personally, there were things that I noticed a lot in my clients as well. So I'm going to share a little bit about my story, but also kind of generalize it to the things I've seen as a pattern. Mm -hmm. I know that 
I was exposed early on to things that inhibited my ability to respond well to emotions. Mm -hmm. So let's say a family environment that does not adequately know how to reflect a child and corrects them instead. So what I mean by that is not you shouldn't correct somebody's behavior, but this is something that's very prominent in family therapy too. We call it emotion coaching, coaching parenting. We want to promote parenting that reflects children's emotional experiences back to them instead of corrects them for the feelings that they're having. So for instance, as a boy, I was more sensitive and a little bit prone towards perfectionism mm -hmm. and uh, maybe a little bit more effeminate and a little bit um, more artistic and creative. And my father, whom I love, who I have a very good relationship with as an adult, uh, was very different than me. We had very different temperaments, different personalities. And we struggled, I think, when I was young to really connect in a way that I could internalize a sense that I'm a boy because I'm like dad. Mm -hmm. And that sense of gender insecurity, I did not have gender identity problems, but gender insecurity mm -hmm. became especially prominent by the time I hit early elementary school because boys tend to notice when a boy is insecure mm -hmm. and then they can become prey to other bullies who pounce on that insecurity. Mm -hmm. So I began getting bullied when I was very young. And I think that reinforced my sense of insecurity. And I didn't turn to my dad. I turned off into my mom for comfort. Mm -hmm. So then I was in the realm of the feminine where I was like safe and nurtured and things were really easy. But the problem with that is eventually that creates a sense of isolation between me and, and the same sex peers I longed to connect with. Because every boy wants to be have attention, affection, approval, affirmation, admiration from their same-sex peers. And that time period, especially early elementary school, you need that to launch you into adolescence where you're then kind of sent forth from your same-sex peer group towards the other, the mysterious other. But for me, the other was not mysterious. It was my realm of safety. Does that make sense? The other meaning the feminine yeah, as the, feminine, the masculine. Right. It was, so the feminine wasn't mysterious and alluring. The feminine was the safe place. Mm -hmm. And what was mysterious and even dangerous was the masculine, even yes. though you were the masculine. Right. But not attentive to that reality within myself. Mm -hmm. And I even defensively began detaching from my dad, resenting him at an early age because I didn't understand him and didn't know how to connect. And I say this not blaming my parents. My parents are amazing. Um, some of this is also just the reality of the messiness of life mm -hmm. and that wounds happen often unintentionally. And no one's immune from wounds in their life. And we're not here to blame. We're just going to name things that I think contributed in my story. But add to that, there was, and this is, you know, something really important to be nuanced about, but exposure to things that I should not have seen or participated in at an early age due to somehow just being accidentally exposed to other children who knew things they shouldn't have known or done things they shouldn't have done or had done to them things that shouldn't have been done to them. And those things primed me for sexualizing attachments that I longed for with men at a very early age. It didn't emerge fully though until I was in my adolescent period when mm -hmm. puberty hits and all the hormones rush in, which sexualize the body and the mm -hmm. person. Well, unmet attachment needs gravitate very strongly towards powerful, pleasurable pulls. Mm -hmm. And one of those is the drive for sexual pleasure and connection, mm -hmm. which is innate to every person. So that's a little bit about my story. Mm -hmm. How does sexual abuse and sexual exposure at an early age, uh, how can that have an impact on someone who might uh, then struggle with sexual attraction, same-sex sexual attraction? Yeah, and the, what's really great about that angle we're looking at here is that even mainstream a American Psychological Association have talked about research studies that even indicate potential causal factors. We're not talking about correlative even. Mm -hmm. Potential causal factors of same-sex sexual abuse in childhood and same-sex partnering in adulthood. So we know, and you, your listeners, I dare them to go look at the research. Mm -hmm. It's easily available online. Study after study show men who have sex with men, and that's a term used in research because the term gay is really cultural. It's not really a research mm -hmm. term. But men who have sex with men have statistically higher rates of sexual abuse in childhood, astronomically higher than men who do not struggle with this issue. Astronomically higher. Some studies five times as high, some more. And we think those numbers, many of us in this field, are even low because due to the clients we work with and people we know, a lot of things that have happened to men who have sex with men in childhood, they don't even see as abuse. 
especially if it happened in adolescence when they were sexually more mature and it was a, somebody who was maybe just over the age of 18 or 21, would, would it be illegal and would be considered abuse, but they didn't see it as such because they were groomed by somebody who seemed safe or led to their sexual awakening. So it's a serious problem. And one of the things that it does is it sexualizes a longing for something deeper than sexuality, that affirmation longing. I long to be affirmed as a man, to be congruent with my sexual identity as a man. And I'm not feeling that from, let's say, my peers or as adequately as I need from my primary father figure. So this person, this boy, now has given me attention in a way that is sexualized and it feels good. Well, it's some people call a fraudulent attachment or mm -hmm. some kind of false attachment. It seems good. And many boys get this through exposure to pornography. And not just men with same-sex attraction, Lila. Mm -hmm. Men who are longing for connection and stumble upon internet porn. Average age of exposure, I've seen studies say, is 8 to 11 years old. Mm -hmm. So it's not just an issue for men with same-sex attraction. But I will say even boys who are not in the past probably predisposed towards same-sex attraction can be conditioned towards other sexual issues due to the content in pornography that sexualizes their brains towards bizarre or unhealthy mm -hmm. models of sexual arousal templates is the word a lot of people like to use. There's so many questions I have. And you, again, I can't thank you enough, Michael, for talking about all of these things because it's so powerful and important and, and being willing to share your story and obviously your clinical work too. But okay, wanted to start with one thing that you just said, which was there are these studies that show that men who have sex with men five times are more likely to have been abused as children. Yep. And I want to ask, probe a little deeper into that because why, why is that? Why is it that child sexual abuse is often part of the history of those who experience same-sex attraction? And I want to say one more thing with that. I remember researching this over the past few years for different reasons, and I found a justification for um, this not being evidence that sexual abuse is responsible for same-sex attraction, but instead that if you are a gay kid, you're more likely to be sexual abused. You see the, slip mm -hmm, of, the, right. the sleight of hand there? So the, you know, the pro sort of LGBTQ identity crowd says, well, that data just shows that gay children are vulnerable to sexual abuse at higher rates than straight children. And so it's no surprise that later on, men who have sex with men have a higher rate of uh, sexual abuse in their mm -hmm. childhoods. I mean, we, that's the, yeah, argument. that's the, yeah. the argument. It's a specious argument, I think, because what is a gay child? What does that mean? Child are not sexually active. So a, a five or six year old child is just a boy or a girl. So what well, I would say, well, the, the child who's, you know, the gay, the boy who is going to be same sex attracted, or maybe has early same sex attraction is more of a target, a soft target for a predator. Well, so what I'm, I'm trying to redefine the terms here. So why are you calling not you, but the, these yeah. arguments are calling that child gay? Why are you even saying that if they're not what it defines someone as gay? If they're five years old, they don't have sexual attractions yet. They might have draws or pulls or attractions towards the same sex in a friendship manner or towards women or girls in a friendship manner or aversion from women or girls in a friendship manner. But we know sexual feelings do not emerge fully until puberty. So again, what defines gay? We should define our terms. If you're saying this is a boy who might develop into a homosexual boy, so you're going to call him pre-homosexual, that's very different. That just means he has certain personality traits or tendencies or maybe he's less masculinized, less assertive. Well, I would argue that that often happens most commonly when this child is not as securely attached mm. to their same-sex parent figure. Now, we also don't have to know perfect causality to say that when correlation is that high, we should at least be curious and not mm. provide reductive, overly simplistic mm. answers. And I think to to say that, oh, that cor that correlation is that high, that it is simply because that child is gay. One, you're not defining gay. And gay is really a cultural identity. it's It's not a definition of feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. And children deserve to not be sexualized through an adult lens. We are sexualizing young people through an adult lens when we say things like that. So when you encounter someone who has child sexual abuse as part of their history, and now they're struggling with same-sex attraction, how do you approach that in a clinical setting? A big thank you to our sponsor, GoodRanchers.com. Good Ranchers is American meat delivered. Did you know that up to 90% of the meat in your grocery store is not from the United States? 
It might say USA on the label, but it's not actually from American ranchers. It's imported and packaged in the United States. Good Ranchers is 100% sourced from the United States. And when you choose GoodRanchers.com, you're choosing more than just delicious meat. You're choosing to support local American farms and ranchers, standing up for transparency and safety in our food supply. At my house, chicken nuggets are an easy and kid-friendly meal, but I'm concerned about the seed oils and the additives in the brands that we purchase at the grocery store. Thankfully, Good Ranchers has created a new seed oil-free nugget. No other nugget on the market offers a pure seed oil-free recipe that prioritizes your family's health without sacrificing flavor or crunch. And right now, if you subscribe at GoodRanchers.com, for a limited time, you can get a free add-on for a full four years or until the next presidential election. That means that when you subscribe to any of the Good Ranchers boxes, you get to decide if you want free chicken breast, Angus ground beef, applewood smoked bacon, or wild-caught salmon in every one of your orders for four years. So go to GoodRanchers.com today. Use my code Lila at checkout to get up to $1,200 of free add-ons. That's GoodRanchers.com, American meat delivered. I want to, before I answer that question, say, I'm not saying everybody who is identifying as gay or has same-sex attraction was abused. And I'm not saying I know of everyone's story. We're talking about trends, general issues, and the need to be curious and be attentive to people's stories so that we can try to get them the help that they need. Um, I'll give you an example of, of a person that I worked with. And as a therapist, you know, this is an anonymized version of a story where some of the details have been changed to protect the identity of my clients. But I worked with a man once who was married to a woman with a family, with children. And this man came to therapy because he was Christian and very devout, but had compulsive sexual behaviors where he would look at homosexual pornographic images and engage in compulsive sexual behaviors uh, on his own at home through masturbation. And this was obviously a problem. It was a problem because it didn't fit with his morals. It did not fit with his ideal for his marriage, and he knew it was hurting his relationship with his wife, and yet he found it enjoyable, but also felt like he couldn't resist it, and he also hated it, and he had shame about it. Okay, so he comes to therapy for what he says is just same-sex attraction, right? He does not come to therapy for sexual abuse. That's not his stated conflict. But what we do in a a situation like that is we foster curiosity openness, receptivity. We do not shame people. We encourage them to accept themselves just as they are radically in the midst of whatever their behaviors or feelings are, even if they don't like them or wish they were different. And through that self-acceptance journey, we begin looking at what are the moments where he's most likely to engage in this compulsive behavior. So for this client, it might've been when he's feeling kind of weak or not very masculine or inadequate as a father. In that case, he was most prone to getting on the internet and looking at images that triggered that sense of that uh, false attachment security. Here's this other person, this man in this image that I feel connected to now. It's an illusion, it's not real. So that's why it's a counterfeit attachment. It's not a real attachment. But in looking at that moment, using reintegrative therapy in this man's case, we just foster reflection. So what we do is we check in with the body, we see what sensations, distress, disturbance, feelings in the body are coming up for you right at that peak moment where you're most tempted to engage in this behavior. And many of our clients feel distress, tension, Mm -hmm. tightness, fear. So we go with that, okay? What does that remind you of? We use trauma, standard evidence-based trauma techniques, like what we call an EMDR, a float back. EMDR is a evidence-based trauma treatment for talk therapists. And in this float back, we say, what does this tension and discomfort in your body remind you of in your past? And we let the mind and 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 the Holy Spirit hopefully guide him. And this man's mind went right back to childhood sexual abuse, whereas a five-year-old, he was systematically abused and groomed by an educator, okay? He didn't even identify that in his adult life as abuse because many times it's impossible to reconcile the complex combination of pleasure and affirmation a child feels when being groomed and abused by a known family friend And so they can't reconcile that, so they just think it was something that happened to them. But shortly after that abuse happened, Lila, he began enacting, and this is in the the field of sexual addiction therapy called trauma reenactment. He began reenacting those exact same behaviors with peers his own age, starting as early as eight or nine years old, and then through high school. And then when he was able to eventually resolve not acting out in person, 
but the behaviors went underground to pornography and masturbation. Well, through the trauma reprocessing we did with that man, we brought in mindful self-compassion, how he could see himself as a child, as a victim. It was the first time in his life he was able to identify he was a victim of abuse. We can help him by God's grace. All healing comes from God. None of this is without God, right? God is the source of all healing, medical, psychological, spiritual healing. We could identify a new narrative, though, what happened to him, how can he make sense of it? We use trauma reprocessing methods, in this case, mindful self-compassion, where the man visualizes loving, caring for, protecting his younger self in a way that nobody protected or could protect at the time. And this reduced the vividness, emotionality, mm -hmm. distress. It provided a new narrative for these foundational trauma memories that influence the trajectory of his sexual feelings and behaviors into adulthood. Okay, so we do that and we go back to the peak trigger moment. All of a sudden, that peak trigger moment where he's most tempted in his current present state to go back to those compensatory behaviors, he sees with a new perspective. He feels less distress. He feels less need to self-regulate with his inadequacy as a man by using an external counterfeit attachment and more able to see himself as a man for who he is as a survivor of abuse and also to foster other healthier relationships in his life. Mm -hmm. So he began working on men's groups. He started going to men's retreats to connect more positively with peers. And that is a great example of a client who left therapy before his healing was done. I know mm -hmm. he went on to other therapists. I know he kept going on to seek healing through support groups, but he, in the time I accompanied him, was able to see God's healing work in his life mm -hmm as an ongoing journey. And I, I was just graced to be able to accompany and witness it. I'm just a facilitator. Mm -hmm. I'm not the healer. You know, I'm just here to accompany. So it was EMDR and understanding himself and his own childhood and how the, the sexual abuse that he experienced impacted him because he didn't even see a sexual abuse that came out in therapy. Yeah. That he was able to help know what were his triggers what were the kind of inadequacies he experienced, he felt that led him to want to look at gay porn and, yep. you know, do these compulsive sexual behaviors. Yes, exactly. And EMDR is one standard evidence-based trauma reprocessing tool that is known to be used for sexual abuse. Uh, the people involved in EMDR don't like the idea that we can use it to treat abuse that might have impacted sexuality development because they tend to be the groups that promote EMDR tend to also be like most psychological organizations, very pro LGBT in a way that refuses to acknowledge that sexual identity can be influenced by trauma, <clears throat> but we still find it as an evidence-based treatment to address trauma. And then the feelings shift as a result. It's not like I'm saying grace builds on nature. Okay. So I'm not saying I have a magic wand and I believe in a God of miracles. I think you probably do too, right? Mm -hmm. So miracles happen, but this wasn't a miracle. But supernaturally, God was at work through this man's journey, both in the way he was able to resolve some of his internal trauma, but also in the way grace acted progressively over time in history, gently, gradually, and in increasing his capacity to respond to his feelings with freedom. So it wasn't like a light switch we turned off, and we weren't even trying to get rid of his feelings. We were trying to help him understand his experiences, meet his emotional needs in healthy ways that were not counterfeit authentic attachments, real attachments with God, with other men, with his wife. So another controversial aspect of this is the yeah, idea yeah. <laughs> that if you are same-sex attracted and you you know go through a therapeutic experience and then you come out of that and then you experience or you can have attractions for the opposite sex. Mm. So I know that's also kind of the stereotype for conversion therapy, mm -hmm. right? How, how, what does that treatment look like? And do you think that that is a good approach to someone who's dealing with unwanted same-sex attraction to help them discover a way to be attracted to the opposite sex. So let's look at this from two full perspective, mm -hmm. ministry and psychological intervention. In, in ministry terms, we never want to put pressure on people to try to change their feelings. But if somebody comes to therapy because they have a goal and a vision for their life that includes marriage and their feelings and their attractions seem like an impediment to their vocation. What they have like is like a deep sense of their call, their vocation. <clears throat> My challenge to other people first is to be on the offensive and say, why don't they have a right to explore how we can help remove impediments to vocation? That's my first instinct. I will go deeper into it, but I, I'll 
Well, a person might say, again, I'm playing devil's advocate here because I know I want people to listen to this who don't maybe fully Mm -hmm. agree. I want them to hear this perspective that they maybe haven't heard before, not in Mm -hmm. its fullness. And so they might say, well, they they should just get married to the same sex. There's a stigma being put on gay marriage. And so they want marriage. And so they just need to get married to the same sex. So we should then define our terms again, because marriage is oriented towards the procreation and rearing of children. And so there's only one way and one definition of marriage for my clients and for myself, which is marriage between a man and a woman that is faithful and lifelong and, and sacramental too. So um, if the people who choose to engage with what they call gay marriage do that in our country right now, they're legally allowed to do that. Mm-hmm. That's another debate, another topic mm-hmm. for another time. <clears throat> but in this context, why should I not have the right to pursue marriage as I understand and define it? What would you what would you do with that client? How would you work with them? Okay, well, let's make it practical. Mm-hmm. Can I talk about a, a Please client? Please do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and then again, these stories they're an, um, t- told with anonymity. Mm-hmm. I want you to know. I want your listeners and you to know. Mm-hmm. If you go to a professional therapist, your story is not going to be broadcast on the podcast. Mm-hmm. So, details. Some details have to be changed. Um, I'm going to talk in a little bit broader, vague mm-hmm. terms to protect client anonymity mm-hmm. above all because it's very important legally and ethically. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the client that comes to mind is one who was a young man, educated, successful, and he had a lot of fear about anxiety performance-wise romantically with women. How will I man up and live up to what expectations women might have for me? So there's a lot of masculine insecurity there. He also had compulsive sexual behaviors Mm -hmm. related to homosexual pornography, but no romantic longing at all to partner with a man. So this is another facet of the nuance of this topic that a lot of people don't talk about, that you might have some same-sex sexual attachments and behaviors, but not be romantically interested in dating or marrying a man, um, and this person fit into that category. So they knew that these sexual feelings and behaviors Mm. were aberrations. They were sort of not representative as of deeply held values, identity. He was a Christian too, so he saw marriage as between a man and a woman. So he came and he was like, what are we going to do? How do we address these? Okay, so there's the the stage has been set, right? Mm. Well, what we start with is just self exploration. Help, let's me. I'm a therapist. I'm gonna accompany you. I'm just here to accompany. I want to see people's goodness. <laughs> that's it. I want to see your goodness, and by that, I just be open to you as a person. Mm. And that starts with learning someone's story. And this person, from an early age, his parents were divorced. From an early age, his father was excessively critical of any display of emotion appropriate to a child's age to the degree that later we're going to identify those experiences as traumas in therapy with him. And by excessively critical, he was mean, he would yell at him. Harsh, unkind, verbally abusive, uh, terrorizing when he would show emotion like crying or sad uh, or anything that was deemed not masculine or maybe just intolerable because the father might have been insecure with his own emotional experiences. So he has to shut down that which reminds him of himself Mm. that he's not accepted within himself yet. Mm. So this young man, we didn't jump in there first. We just started talking about family dynamics. You know, mom and dad were divorced. His mom was very religious, but tend to be very fearful about sexuality. You might call it puritanical. The body is kind of to be feared and sexuality is it's viewed a little bit more from a fundamentalist perspective as sort of a bad thing. So this client, what we would do is start by understanding when I'm this, and I say I'm, me, the client, most tempted to engage in these compulsive behaviors, which are not in line with my ideals or my goal for my life. Just like I said with the previous client, what does that remind him of physiologically? The, the body keeps the score as trauma as specialist Bessel van, der, Bessel van der Kolk's book states. Mm-hmm. The body keeps the score of trauma. We know in our body, we trust our feelings and our sensations. Our mind will take us back. The Holy Spirit and our faculties will take us back to those early experiences that contributed to our perception of the world or ourselves. It gets distorted and filtered through trauma. And so with this young man, Lila, those early experiences with hypercritical father and mother who was anxious and fearful influenced his perception of men and women in a way that skewed his development. Now, what's interesting, and this is another tangent that is related to his story, but I think you might have some questions about too. As we started with trauma reprocessing for him, trying to use EMDR, mindful self-compassion, he had emotional blocks. Mm -hmm. 
And these were largely related to obsessive compulsive scrupulous fear. And for many men, gay men especially, gay identified men, non-gay identified men who have SSA, there's a statistically significant higher level of OCD. It's in almost every client I work with has diagnosable levels of OCD that has same-sex attraction. And most of them who are religious with SSA have scrupulous religious-based obsessive compulsive disorder. So for this man, if we looked at trauma memories and we looked at blocks towards women that he experienced in adolescence, there was a lot of fear. And that fear emerged in these symptoms of obsessive compulsive certainty seeking, obsessive compulsive fear about religion and about God, obsessive and compulsive behaviors, because the fear of sexuality doesn't get rid of sexuality. It drives sexuality further out of the realm of reason. And our passions are meant, they're by their nature, ordered to be guided by reason. But if you have a mom who inculcates fear about the body and about sexuality due to misunderstandings of theology and not a trust in the innate goodness of sexuality, that can contribute to these avoidances and these fears that lead to emotional repression. And emerging out of that is obsessive compulsive behaviors. Because if, if now sexuality is not in front of me where I can look at it, accept it, praise God for it, integrate it, guide it with right reason. Like I said, it doesn't go away. It just gets pushed further to the peripheries where it emerges in dissociative and compulsive ways. So we began to look at how to help reduce his shame and fear about sexuality in general, even as they emerge in objectively disordered ways in his life as part of the trauma treatment. So between looking at the early childhood traumas, addressing obsessive compulsive fear and religious scrupulosity, and cultivating his imagination towards what he's capable of with women, <clears throat> this client began to show signs of emerging masculinity, confidence. And by the time we were starting to come to wrap treatment, Lila, he was in a serious relationship with a woman. He still had residual wounds to look at, some compulsive behaviors he was still struggling with, but he felt confident and courageous enough to be engaging in a relationship. His girlfriend and him were very serious. And I'll tell you, the only reason he left therapy is he felt it was time to go specifically to focus more on spiritual healing. So he pursued remaining healing for himself and a spiritual one through his church. He was an evangelical Christian. And so we should not minimize either. And I'm, I'm really glad to be just briefly mm -hmm. touching on this. We should not minimize out of fear that people say we're telling you to pray the gay away. Spiritual healing is an essential part of many people's healing journeys when they're emerging out of sexual chaos and sexual brokenness. So while I'm all for psychological interventions, and I believe God is the source of all healing, even in psychological mm -hmm. domain, there is a real need for deliverance ministry and for spiritual healing for many people who have been touched by the twofold wound of sexual abuse or other types of deficits where the enemy attaches itself to those wounds and keeps us stuck in those lies that I'm not a complete man. My sexual identity is somehow flawed because my dad and I didn't connect or my mom made me afraid of sexuality. And this is the spiritual reality we have to face. I don't want to scare people, but like, because Jesus is Lord, we don't have to be afraid, but we shouldn't put our heads in the sand either. There is that common narrative of the person who experienced a very restrictive or puritanical upbringing when it com comes to sexuality or like the body. Mm -hmm. And then later on, they kind of go wild, you know, right? or in their view, maybe they wouldn't consider it wild. They were just free, you know, sexually free. And I think even the you know, the last century, you look at the last century and you look at, you know, the 1950s housewife and, you know, the American family all buttoned up and, <laughs> you know, divorce rates are fairly low and people are in intact relationships and, you know, sexual uh, chaos. You mentioned that term that sexual libertinism, you know, sex outside of a one man, one woman marriage was seen as a bad thing, mm. largely culturally. Mm -hmm. And then the sexual revolution hits, you know, in the 60s and 70s. And now right. it's like, whatever, as long as there's consent, you do you. It was like one big, you know, middle finger to this <laughs> view of human sexuality. Right. Do you think that, how do you think that, like, there's so many questions I have about this, but let's start really practical. If you are a parent and you want to help your child have healthy sexual development, but you don't want to also expose them to sexuality too young of an age. You want to do this appropriately mm -hmm. and you want to give them a sense of love for their body and freedom while at the same time helping them live a morally ordered life. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess the question is like, what would, what should of the 1950s uh, <laughs> parents, the parents of that generation do to prevent the chaos of the sixties and the seventies? 
I love that question. And I think a lot of young women and young mothers need to know how and be affirmed in the goodness of their role as mothers mm. and how important it is. Um, William Wallace Ross, I think was his name, said, she who or he who yeah. or they who rock the cradle, the one who rocks the cradle, cradle rules the world. Yes. It is this really beautiful poem. I was reading it yesterday about the value of motherhood. So my instinct is first, one of the saddest things that our culture is seeing is a devaluing of the uniqueness of each parental role. And in this case, like, let's talk about moms, how important motherhood is. And one of the things mothers do is protect and nurture. And in a way that I would say is the first default. So especially in our freedom for license culture, where it's like freedom is how much choice you have, not freedom for morality, which is really in the tradition of the church, mm -hmm. what freedom really means. It's like the freedom for good. Um, how, protecting your children is important. That means protecting them from exposure. We have to encourage moms and dads. And I know your audience probably already is aware of this, mm -hmm. but prevention is better than treatment. <laughs> So what's better than going to therapy and getting help? Not needing therapy. Um, not that I don't, I mean, I recommend therapy for people who need it, but we've got to think more in prevention. And one of the best ways we can prevent is, is monitoring what our children are exposed to. And mothers, I think, are especially good at that. Not out of fear, though. Uh, we protect out of love. Love for God and his designs. So I, I don't think you, you need as a mom to be a crusader against all of culture, um, or even against your children, <laughs> you know, but just first and foremost, out of love, trusting that God with you will help protect your children from media and other factors that are going to expose them and try to sexualize them at an earlier age and is helpful. That's my first instinct. I, I love that. I, I mean, obviously protecting your kids from, you know, pornographic media or media with sexual themes when they're young is very important. Uh, what about relationships with peer groups? Because you mentioned that can also be a challenge for kids. They're getting bullied or unfortunately, you know, kids who are sexually abused may go on to uh, sexually, you know, experiment with other kids, mm -hmm. you know, live out and play out what they endured. What would be other advice you'd have for, for moms to protect their kids? Yeah. And for moms in particular, I think befriending and being friends with the parents of your children's friends, that's kind of by default how I think a lot of us millennial people grew up. Like my mom and dad were friends with a lot of my friend's parents, which I think is a good thing because then you're connecting with each other's lives and families and connecting with families who share similar values. It's not that life is black and white and I get that the, ver the range of values is gonna be not perfectly aligned family to family, but cultivating relationships with families that share your values so you can trust when your children are together that there's a lower likelihood that there's going to be problems. But I do think we're at a stage in a place where parents need to be vigilant about who their children are staying are playing with, how what play dates look like. I don't want to cause fear. I'm not at mm -hmm. all trying to encourage fear. But I think limiting exposure, guiding and guarding who our children are around and trying to really inculcate good themes early on. Like mm -hmm. we might talk about a little bit, like music for children that's really positive, uh, educational materials for children that's really positive. And also, we haven't got to this yet, but sexual education, let's talk about that in terms of like education on life and love, mm -hmm. not just like mechanics, you know? <laughs> it's just so like reductive to be like, oh, we need to provide sexual education that teaches all these mechanics. It's like, what about fostering understanding of love and understanding of relationship? That's such a good point. And I, I think we've talked about this before in the show, but I know I talk about it in my work at Live Action, but sex education, like you use the word mechanics, it's about literally putting a condom on a banana. I mean, mm. for a lot of <laughs> kids today and the mechanics of how sex works when sex is about a relationship, it's not just about body parts. Yeah. You know, you are a person. You're not a, just a body. You yes. are, your body is a person, I should say, and you are a soul and a body. And that makes you a person, a human person. And yep. so I love that idea of let's educate them on, on life and love as opposed to let's just talk about sex. Yep. Sex is part of life and love. What does good sexual education look like? And the church writes about this. Just recently, I was reviewing a document from 1995. The Vatican Post mm -hmm. published a document on this sexual education in the family. And I think we really want, I'm really passionate about empowering parents to know that it is their responsibility their duty, their privilege, and their right as parents to be the primary educators of their children. 
they should never be forced out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And anything that they, let's say, turn over to an outside entity should be minimal in this topic and should be very well guarded. And that's complicated because a lot of times parents have children in public schools or even in Catholic schools that might not align completely with their ideals. But you have a responsibility to educate your children. And if they're asking questions to you, mom and dad, they're old enough to start talking about it. That's a good sign. Even if it's a little earlier than you might think they should. In general, we should not be having these conversations on life and love specifically, probably till a little closer towards puberty. There's no exact age. Puberty is happening earlier and earlier, too, I think, for men and women. So maybe 8 to 10 for girls, 10 to 11 years old for boys. But you have to know your family and your children. And if if they're old enough to ask pointed questions, that somehow that door is open now. And pre-act, preemptively, you need to be considering what age do you think your children are ready to hear this. Once puberty is hit, the ship has kind of sailed. Like, I mean, you can correct course, but we should be preemptively considering these things. And one thing I love, a friend of mine who's a priest was telling me when we were talking about mm. sexual education and families, he said a, fa a father that wrote, Jared O'Shea, I think his name was, he wrote a program on this that I'll have to remember the resource, I can send it later. Mm. But the idea was that his sons and him met once a week as they started getting closer to those ages on Sundays for conversations scaled over time every week about life and love. Mm. Every week, it wasn't a conversation. It wasn't like a birds and the bees conversation. It was cultivating a discussion on life and love over a period of a year that themes began to emerge more gradually over time. And that then is a relationship building experience. Mm -hmm. Okay, because think about this. You Such can't cover everything. Idea. Yeah, and you can't cover everything in a, in a talk. But what you can do is foster mm -hmm. there's no shame. Mm -hmm. You can foster that this is a relationship you can come to if you're in, in need. Because what, what is one of the worst things that can happen? A child has questions and they turn to who? Their friends, the internet. That's mm -hmm. like the worst case scenario. <laughs> Their teachers, no offense, teachers are great, but like this is like for mom and dad. So if you preemptively start these conversations over a period of time, especially dads with their boys, <clears throat> excuse me, moms with their daughters, I think that's the foundation for relationship, which builds trust. And then the children will continue to turn towards you when those newer, more specific questions or difficulties begin to emerge. What about protecting kids from sexual abuse by educating them? There's like, especially like in the mommy blogger world and yep. mommy Instagram world, t t talking to your kids in advance about their bodies. This is your body. It's only for you. These are your, you know, these parts are private. They're only if mom is, you know, changing your diaper or, you know, or if they're a little bit older, you know, we don't play with this part of our body. This mm -hmm. no one is supposed to touch this part of your body. If someone makes you uncomfortable, then, you know, there's a whole, uh, you know, narrative, uh, there's a whole uh, script that they encourage parents maybe to use. Uh, what's your take on that? I think it's good. I think you should know your own children, though, and try to be sensitive to like what age and to what degree your child can tolerate that information. Um, and I think the default is what is your intention and attitude as a parent? Mm -hmm. Do you have fear? Or are you educating out of love? Um, that's the whole story, right? Like, am I educating out of fear or out of love? And I love Father Jacques Philippe. He writes a lot mm -hmm. about false compassion. He's versus, awesome. Oh my gosh, he changed my life. Mm -hmm. And he writes about false compassion versus true compassion. And he says, false compassion comes out of a sense, and I do this all the time. Jesus help me. False compassion comes out of a sense that God does not love this person infinitely more than I do. And God is not capable of caring for them through whatever they go through infinitely more than I am. Whereas true compassion is grounded in the knowledge that God loves this child infinitely more than I love mm -hmm. them and is there is for them infinitely more than I can even mm -hmm. be for them. And so in trust in God's fatherhood, in trust that these children are gifts that I am stewarding. They are God's mm -hmm. children. I, out of love for God's designs, offer education to my children. You're good to go because out of love, if you offer these scripts, it will come across to your children as love. But if it's out of fear, it will cause them fear. And fear drives things in directions that are not helpful. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so love, love, love. I know it sounds simple, but it, it's it's simple but tough. We need to ask for the grace. Mm -hmm. we, parents, I want to encourage moms and dads listening to this. 
you are not educating on your own. God is with you. He is for you. He is more for you than you are for yourself. So do we trust that as Christians? Do we trust that the sacred heart of Jesus is for us, not against us? Because if we trust that, these conversations mm. will be fruitful. But when we come out of fear, it's not as helpful. And the last thing I'll add, I know I'm rambling a little no, bit. No, it's but great. It's great. What, what I think is really great to consider is even if something bad happens to your child, God forbid, your reaction can make it better or worse. So mm. if your child does come home and say, so-and-so touched me in my private swimsuit mm. area, if as a parent in love, you can trust that God is with you and your child, you need not overreact or react in fear. <clears throat> that reactivity can actually cause trauma where there might not have been much trauma yet. Mm. Maybe they say, mom, you know, somebody touched me here and it felt good and exciting. That might be a great chance to say, oh, you know what? That's normal that it felt that way, but that's something we save for marriage. And that's something we only, you know, we we keep private for very good reasons. And so let's talk more about that. So you're talking about like an adolescent who had this inadvertent sexual experience and they're sharing it with the parent. It could be an adolescent. It could be even a, a child who, mm -hmm. uh, you know, through some child play that got went with wrong other with other kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not saying it's a good idea. Yeah. Children should not play and engage in sexual play that mm -hmm. is unhealthy and harmful to children. But sometimes something might happen where your child relays a story to you that goes against even those boundaries and outlines mm -hmm. you've set. How do you react as a parent? And if you react in fear and excessive reactivity, mm -hmm. that might send a message that I've done mm -hmm. something wrong. I should be ashamed. And imagine the pleasure is not the problem. So if a child says, it felt good when a friend touched mm -hmm. me there, that pleasure they felt is normal to the body. So the pleasure is not the problem. The problem is they were touched inappropriately by, mm -hmm. and they shouldn't have been. So as a parent, you can acknowledge and reflect their experience. Oh, at, that felt exciting when somebody touched you. Okay, well, that's normal for it to feel that way, but we shouldn't be touched mm -hmm. like that. And just redirect and use that as another grounds for, of course, if you need to set a boundary or address any abuse, that's essential. But then in terms of your reactivity to your child themselves, mm -hmm. not reacting in fear is very important because then they might internalize shame. I've done something wrong. When they at age five or six years old, they don't fully understand what even happened to them yet. And we don't want to, we don't want to cause fear or shame for a child in that situation. But certainly if there's, you know, somebody who is, it's not just two kids of the same age having play and then accidentally mm -hmm. there's some sexual element to it. But we're also talking about maybe sexual abuse yes. where it's a, a, an authority figure or someone who's older and they're sexualizing the child. And in that case, I mean, isn't it good to have healthy fear? I mean, should the child have fear of that? Certainly that person, there should be justice Right. So for the parent, that kid yeah, and that yeah. person is, you know, gets uh, gets accountability for what they've done, you know, et cetera. Right. If, if there's any suspicion that your child has been abused and even, by the way, same same age play is mm -hmm. can, can cause abusive factors. And it, often children that engage in that were taught that by an adult. So I'm not minimizing mm -hmm. the damage that can be done even by same age childhood sexual experimentation. It's not good. It's not helpful, especially before the age of reason. It causes extreme amounts of shame and confusion for children because pleasure feelings are aroused in the body before they're rationally mm -hmm. capable of acknowledging what's mm -hmm. happening and, and guiding it towards right action. So it's very harmful. It should be avoided. We need to protect children. And especially if there is any suspicion mm -hmm. of abuse from an adult, take every step necessary to protect and act justice, combat that abuse, remove your child mm -hmm. from that situation. But your emotional reaction to your child, if it is mm -hmm. excessive and fearful to them, might not help them process what happened to I them. I see. There's a few more questions I want to ask, picking up on some threads we dropped earlier that you know, there's so many, so much good stuff in this interview. So thank you. A lot, a lot to think, think about, lots of substance here. When it comes to, you mentioned, you know, these kind of anonymized stories of clients and you talked about the, um, you know, someone who is having, struggling with these, uh, compulsive sexual behaviors Yep. here. This is something we've talked about in the show before. I'm curious your take on it. Do you think that someone who is struggling with compulsive sexual behaviors should be in a relationship, should be dating or should get married? Should is a strong word. I think would you recommend it? I would say, let me order this towards a general idea mm. to prepare oneself for relationship with others, work on yourself. 
the point at which someone is ready for a relationship is such a nuanced topic mm -hmm. that I would be cautious to make a general recommendation. Are you being honest with yourself about your struggles? Mm -hmm. Are you being honest with others about your struggles? Are you actively seeking help and support? And are you being honest with the person you're trying mm -hmm. to potentially date? I think this is really about honesty, preparation, and receptivity more than I can give a practical mm -hmm. specific guideline. <clears throat> Healing is messy. And here's the thing. As a therapist, I've accompanied many clients for many years who are striving to follow God. That's the key. And are we open to God's work in our life? Mm -hmm. And grace upon grace implies to me, God, help me to be open to you working in my life. We don't even have to be open on our own. So that's the message of hope I want to give because this healing journey, Lila, it's messy. Mm -hmm. It's up and down for people. Many people we're working with have gone through, and people like you know who have struggled with same-sex attraction have complex, varied stories of a whole variety of factors in their life that are making this area of their life difficult to integrate. So I would just dare, dare people to be hopeful, to be honest with themselves and others, and seek help before jumping into a relationship as some kind of I don't know, prescriptive measure. Oh, I, I have these issues. If I just date or get married, that'll help resolve my compulsive behaviors. No, nope, absolutely not. We need to face those and deal with them, but recovery is a journey. And so where someone in their recovery journey is ready to date is gonna be very individualized. But as Catholics, I would say, are you seeking spiritual direction? Are you getting wise counsel? And are you in, in the sacramental life? Things like that are important to consider. Do you think that priests with same-sex attraction oh. should, let's start with the seminarians, actually. Do you think that men with same-sex attraction should go to seminary? That topic is fraught with a lot of nuance. Mm. People like Dr. Timothy Locke, who's a good friend of mine, working in Connecticut at a seminary up there. They, Him and some other psychologists just released a white paper on this topic. The church says men with deep-seated same-sex attractions should not be admitted in a seminary. And Pope Francis has reiterated the norms established by his predecessors. So this is not controversial in the magisterial direction of the church's teachings. What is controversial is how active it's been applied and how to apply it well. And I do work with seminarians and pre-seminarians, some as well as a therapist and in educational capacities. And what we want to think about is affective maturity. That's the term the church is going to use a lot. And they're going to see this issue from the lens of psychosexual maturity. Somebody who is psychosexually mature and affectively mature is both capable of receiving the gift of their sexuality and freely offering that gift in, cel in the celibate priesthood. So if that person is struggling with deep-seated homosexual tendencies and has not yet resolved underlying factors or grown or matured through those issues, then the seminaries are going to be hesitant to admit them mm -hmm. And out of a desire that they are able to heal and mature and grow in a way that would make them capable of giving the free gift of the celibate, vo celibate calling to God. So could it be possible for someone to have experienced deep-seated same-sex sexual attraction and then later on through a healing process be free from that intense, that level of intense same-sex sexual attraction? I believe so. Have I you believe seen so. that in your practice? I have seen it in my practice, but I've also, I've not worked with seminarians specifically in that capacity. Or I'm talking generally too, of just people that yes. had the deep seated but nature no, of, of the attraction. Yeah. But let's not just limit it to my practice. Let's talk about people like your friend, Kim Zimber. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about people like the Protestant brothers and sisters we have at the changed movement. Let's talk about personal friends of mine. One who I was just talking with this morning, who I went through therapeutic peer support groups with 10 years ago, who is married with three beautiful children mm -hmm. to a woman he loves, who both support me and encourage me in my own journey, steps ahead. I sang at their wedding. Mm -hmm. These people need to know these stories are real. I think some people in the culture, and again, I don't want to, I feel like I'm, I'm a negative Nancy in this interview <laughs> a lot, but I'm doing this intentionally because I, I want this to help people who have yep. these objections. Like that is my, and I know that's your heart too. So I think some people might say, well, they're just pretending, they're just putting on this you know, because they have so much shame around same sex attraction and gay marriage and stuff. So they're putting on this other personality, but they're still restricted. You know, they're, they're not mm. fully free. Mm. That's an interesting angle, huh? Well, <laughs> the science is clear 
Sexual fluidity mm -hmm. is real. Even people like Dr. Lisa Diamond, who is a leading pro-LGBT lesbian identified mm -hmm. researcher, put out a TED talk called Born This Way is a Lie. And you can find that TED talk on YouTube. I don't recommend mm -hmm. it because it's full of other lies. But <clears throat> she argues in the name of sexual liberation, born this way is unjust because mm -hmm. she acknowledges through her research of female same-sex attraction, the fluidity is so significant mm -hmm. that women have the quote, right to sexual fluidity. And if they are taught the lie that it's born that way, they won't be rightfully allowed to experiment with homosexuality. Now her conclusion is wild as a Christian. I obviously mm -hmm. think this is not a good idea, but the evidence she uses is very convincing that you are not just mm -hmm. born one way or the other. Fluidity exists. The science is clear. It's a spectrum men's sexual feelings tend to be less fluid from research than women's, but a lot of this has to do with personal conviction and desires and goals. If a man comes to me or to ministry with same-sex attraction and doesn't desire to explore the underlying causes, but just wants to live in line with their own conscience, there's ministry we can do to support them trying to just live according, chastely according to the Catholic teachings. But if somebody comes to you and says like, but I really want to be married and have a family, I feel a call from God how do we help them? And I think that it can be very unfair to put people into categorical change or not change uh, sort of paradigms. Because, okay, think about this. People come to therapy for anxiety. They have a 10 out of 10 anxiety, panic disorder. Over two years in therapy and through ministry support and through peer support, they go down from a 10 to a four and they're mostly functional, but they still struggle. Would we be like, well, you didn't really change because it's not completely gone or you know you didn't 100% rid this scourge of this difficulty from your life. No, we would celebrate the way they were able to find healing and growth and encourage to face their problems. So why do we put this false paradigm of black and white thinking and sort of writing someone else's narrative for them with this issue? I think it's unfair, it's unrealistic. And I don't know, just take people at their word. Like I love his, I'm not gonna say their names because it's private, but like his three children are adorable and beautiful and they have a happy family and they, I go to church with them. It's like, that's a real family. Like you're saying, don't let, you're calling them repressed. That's up for, up for them to decide. Yeah, let somebody else decide yeah. what's repressed. Yes. And mm -hmm. like my friend is not repressed. He's wonderful <laughs> and loving and a good father, a heck of a father and an encourager and a brother to me. And people like that, I'm not telling a story to say everyone should do that or everyone's even capable of that. I don't know what God has in store for each person, mm -hmm. but like, I'm not going to limit people. I'm not going to put an arbitrary limitation on what God can do in their life. Mm -hmm. I have been healed of so many things in my life that I didn't think were possible. I mean, physical healings, spiritual healings, psychological healings, the healing of God is real and it comes in many forms and we need to be champions mm -hmm. of hope because it all points to like eternal hope. Right? Like it's all like every healing we experience psychologically, spiritually, every way we are able to more image Christ in the world through marriage, uh, you know, which prefigures the eternal, we're the bride of Christ. So all these signs of God's love and goodness in our life, like let's not limit it. We're Christians. Let's be countercultural and dare to like proclaim the goodness of the gospel, which would be hard to believe how good it is, not like easy to write it off. I love that. Do you think we're going to see a time in our culture and in California where the script will be flipped on all of these sexuality things back to hmm. reality, back to truth. I think it's worth fighting for. And I don't mean fighting with violence. You know that, but just in case anyone's listening, that's going <laughs> to accuse me of that. I think it's worth fighting mm -hmm. for. And we fight by our, our love. And by the way, we try to dare people to see something that is true and beautiful and good within themselves. I, I cannot get people to do anything. The Holy Spirit can speak through us to reveal mm -hmm. people to themselves. So, you know, if somebody's promoting a vision for human flourishing that is false and bad and ugly, we don't have to rely on ourselves to, to mm -hmm. fight this battle. The Holy Spirit is with us. Amen. You've created music yourself. This is one of your yes. passions about uh, the body and mm -hmm. these things for kids. I mean, that's yep. something that you're you're very passionate about. Can you share a little more about that? Yes. So I love music and I grew up going to vacation Bible school mm -hmm. and learning songs for Bible verses like throughout my childhood. Did you ever go to those like vacation Bible schools? Yeah, I did a little bit of that. Okay. So like I have all these verses of the Bible in my mind from vacation That's Bible awesome. school songs that I can still like recall at any moment. And that kind of tells me the power of music to teach lessons to children. Have you noticed that some of the music that children listen to though is 
obnoxious at best at times and sometimes like almost hypnotic and bizarre have you, like coco melon or... melon i know it's so true <laughs> yeah it's, and it's also remarkable so mr rogers has this very lovely yes. regal i mean it's like there's a refinement yes. to it but there's a down-to-earthness to it and it's very normal. He's not like trying to entertain them. Like, yeah, look at me. I'm so crazy. And like, la, 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 bright colors. Yes. Like he's just this very like genteel is the word. He's a very genteel, kind man, but he's still captivating. Yes. Now, if you put a kid on a steady diet of cocoa melon, he might struggle to be entertained by Mr. Rogers. But if Mr. Rogers is his access to, you know, that's his experience with TV, then he'll learn you know, he'll learn stuff and he'll yep. be captivated by Mr. Rogers. So yes, I, I think can't there's so much power up. there. Yeah. I've been reading a book called the world according to Mr. Rogers right now. He mm -hmm. studied child development throughout his entire life. Wow. He was a minister. He was a devout Christian and he was an expert musician. Uh, that man, I have wept recently reading his literature of, of little statements about life and love and child development. Wow. that He wrote. He was brilliant. And that is, a, he's what made a, you cry? <clears throat> oh, so many different things. Basically, his life philosophy was that children need to be allowed to learn that they're loved. That's the most important thing that a child could ever learn is that they're loved just as they are. But he did not limit people to what they could become. He wanted to foster the capacity to see potential for yourself and his gentleness. I think it was it, it, when he writes, if you listen to his songs, he's just so gentle. Um, and but he's so, still a man. You know, yeah, that's a like thing. No one questioned that yeah. he was married to a woman. He was a father. He was not. Um, he was childlike without being too childish. He was gentle without being effeminate. Yeah. Uh, which is, which is striking because I think there is the, the stereotype that if you're gentle, then you're not man. Right. Right. Uh, or if you're not gentle, then somehow you are strong in some way or you're, you know, tough. Right. He was a scholarly type. He was a musician. So <clears throat> could that be masculine? Yes. We, we don't want to get caught in this sort of like mm. cultural dichotomy that masculinity is equivalent to much macho ness or mm. something. He was very masculine. Um, and so he's like a model for me of how to write songs for mm. children and, and the good that music can do to teach children about their lovableness, about the goodness of their bodies. I think the reason I got excited about writing these songs is because I have two hats I've worn throughout my life. One is music educator. I taught voice lessons and piano lessons and music theater mm. camps for kids um, music ministry, working in churches with children's choirs and children's caroling groups. But then also now I'm a therapist and I study development and human psychology. And so I thought, how can these two parts of me mm -hmm. kind of get integrated? And this idea through a friend of mine who's a priest and also through my own reflection came that we should write songs that encourage constructs of theology, the body of Catholic anthropology to teach lessons, lessons to kids at age appropriate ways mm -hmm. that can stick with them and maybe provide the foundation for some meaningful educational experiences based in music. I love that. Mr. Rogers, we both love him, but you were saying he's inspired you to write more songs for kids yourself. Yeah. And there, there are songs about the body yep. and self-worth. Can I venture to say that? Sure. Or yeah. Like authentic self-worth, which authentic is rooted in God's view of love us as children. Us. Yeah. Mm. Can you share? Oh yeah. One and of your also, songs? I will happily share about my songs and these songs are educational material. So they're catechetical. Mm -hmm. So they're more complex than let's say just like a, a generic praise song, although praise is a part of these songs, praise mm -hmm. of God. Um, but they're meant to go along with educational materials. So organizations like Rua Woods Institute, have you heard of them? Mm -hmm. I, no, I have not. Okay. Tell me about Rua them. Woods Institute is a psychological institute leading the charge on creating curriculum K through 12 that integrates theology of the body concepts and their lessons for kindergarten and first grade. Amazing. Yes. They're narrative based. They have like storybooks they mm. use to kind of make these very visceral lessons mm. for kids. And they're one group, another group called theology of the body parent school, mm. which, which is one, another one that I'm familiar with who created workbooks for children of this age range. And a lot of them use what uh, the Cardinal Newman society published what they called Christian anthropology standards. And these standards take theology of the body concepts and Catholic theology concepts and boil them down to age appropriate material, especially for in this case, like mm -hmm. two to six years old, which is mm -hmm. where my songs are focused. <clears throat> so these songs, I'm looking for people like that to partner with, to potentially collaborate mm -hmm. so that they can be paired with these types of educational lessons so they can further be points of discussion for family. Very cool. Yeah. Oh, I'm so excited. I cannot tell you how excited I am. What's your favorite song? Okay. <clears throat> Several of them come to mind. And I've realized 
I waited my whole life to write an album and share an album. And I'm telling you, the Lord works in mysterious ways because I never thought I would be writing children's mm. music ever, ever. And the funniest part is God is trying to help me not take myself as seriously. Mm. <clears throat> and then this album, I had to make animal sounds. So it's really hard to take yourself seriously when you're oinking like a pig. So Jesus is helping me be childlike. <clears throat> One of the songs that I love, that I think is part of the antidote to sort of the gender ideology stuff mm. is just the basic teaching that the body and soul are one. You can't be born in the wrong body, right? Like that's kind of basic Christian teaching. <clears throat> so that song from my, uh, my album is called God Gave Me Me. Mm. You want me to share part of it? Yeah, you? please do. Oh, I've been talking a lot. Okay. <laughs> God gave me my body and I like it. God gave me my soul. They're both mine. They are one and that's what makes me me. And God loves me all the time. I said, God gave me my body and I like it. God gave me my soul. They're both mine. They are one and that's what makes me me. And God loves me all the time thank you that's lovely there's verses but we'll leave that for mystery that so that's the chorus that's the chorus because mm -hmm. for me <clears throat> educational music has to be catchy singable fun silly the verses we get into a little more deep theology and that's mm -hmm. partly because when you're educating children you're educating mm -hmm. the family mm -hmm. so the parents are listening to the verses they're able to think about more deep concepts I'll share a verse with that song for you. The soul you cannot see, but God gives it to you freely, giving life to your body. Your soul can love completely. Oh, God gave me my body and I like it. God gave me my soul, they're both mine. They are one and that's what makes me me. And we love you all the time. Yes, Lord. Thank you, God, for all you've given me. And we love you all the time. Very cool. <laughs> I don't right. want to share it. So we're going to have to link that in the bio yeah, or link that website. in the description so that folks can find it. Michael, this has been awesome. How can people find your work? Um, they can visit me at my website, which you guys can link if you want, michaelgasparo.com. Um, so I'm available there. You can contact me, reach out to me for any kind of questions they have. And are there any resources that you would also recommend? And this might be at your website too, mm -hmm. for people who are themselves experiencing same-sex attraction or they have loved ones who are and they're looking for good therapists yes. and good people to accompany them. There's a couple. Do you mind if I share a couple please different do, resources? Do. Okay. So the Catholic psychotherapy, I'm not being paid for this, by the way. <laughs> These are not paid promotions. The Catholic Psychotherapy Association mm -hmm. is a fantastic group based out of Georgia with hundreds of psychologists and therapists from around the country who are committed to the teachings of the church. We don't all agree on exactly how to address this issue or, you know, there's lots of nuance with this therapeutically modalities and ministry support, but we're that organization is on the same page. The teachings of the church are true, and we need to help people live in accord with them. Catholic Psychotherapy Association. I'm on the board for a therapy organization called the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity, devoted to promoting a Judeo-Christian worldview of human sexuality and providing professional, competent therapy in accord with that vision. Check them out. Another really good resource are ministry support organizations. You have people like Dr. Bob Schutz, who you probably know about, mm -hmm. JP2 Healing Institute, mm -hmm. and the Theology of the Body Institute, where, and Desert Streams Living Waters, which is ministry and pastoral organizations geared towards spiritual, especially matters that can influence sexual brokenness, sexual wounds, um, and there's many other resources, but those are a few to start with. And they can reach out to me if they want additional ideas. Amazing. Thank you so much, Michael. You're awesome. Keep up the good work. Thank you. It's so important. Thank you for having me. For letting for me coming. talk with you. And thanks for singing. Yes. <laughs> Bring the guitar next time. You, yeah, you don't or have the to, piano. It's, you don't have to twist my arm to sing. I'll sing anytime. <laughs> A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest religious network reaching millions of people with the truth of the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.